In this video, we're going to introduce the quantum angular momentum operator and how that pertains to the rotational Hamiltonian, which governs this uh, rotational spectroscopy dynamics that we're going to visualize. Okay, so in the last video on angular momentum, we derived that the rotational Hamiltonian over here is purely kinetic energy, right? Because there's no potential energy involved if you have a free rotating particle or free rotating molecule. So this is the correct angular momentum. In the previous video, it was written like this. Okay, and this is, this is incorrect, and we'll see why this ends up being incorrect later on. And so just to be really clear, This is the correct rotational Hamiltonian we're going to use with mu and not i, so the reduced mass and not the moment of inertia. And below this, I have I've written here the full Laplacian in spherical coordinates, right? So this takes on a much more complicated form than what we're used to relative to Cartesian coordinates. Remember, in Cartesian coordinates, this is just ddx squared plus ddy squared plus ddz squared. Um, but in this case, you have a much more complicated dependencies on all the different derivatives. Okay, but we can simplify this a little bit because we're, again, we're interested in a, a fixed distance, right? So anything that has a derivative with respect to distance, we can just forget about right away. So this first term, uh, we can just ignore. And the next thing we can do is we can set the actual distance that we're interested in. So to be more concrete, we will set r equal to l, right? So this fixed distance that we're interested in is actually the distance between the two atoms that are rotating. And so we're going to rewrite this using that r is equal to l. Okay, so now let's take this and plug it into our Hamiltonian and see what happens. Okay, so if we look at this, you'll notice that there is a 1 over L squared in both terms here, and we have this mu here. And so we can combine these, right? So we have mu over, or 1 over mu times L squared in every term here. And remember this mu L squared down here is exactly the definition of the moment of inertia. And so we can just directly replace that right here. Okay, and this is all what this is all equal to the Hamiltonian, right? This is pl just plugging everything into the Hamiltonian. Remember when we wrote this classically, we showed that the kinetic energy of a rotating particle can be written as L squared over 2i, right? Where L, L squared is the angular momentum squared. So if we look at this equation and we compare this to what we have for L squared over 2i, then we would see that all of this stuff here would be the quantum mechanical version of L squared. Right, and so this implies that we have the L squared operator 
is equal to Whoops, need to move this over to make some room for a minus h bar squared. Okay, so this gives us a quantum mechanical definition of the operator L squared. So this might seem a little weird, right, because what we're doing is defining the quantum mechanical operator for L squared before we've talked about what the quantum mechanical version of L is. Um, but the reason for that is just that L squared is a little bit simpler. Okay, so L is actually a vector, and the components of the vector are x, y, and z components of the angular momentum. And I'll give you an example of what that would look like in just a second. So the classical definition of the angular momentum is given as P cross R. So this is the cross product, and P is the momentum up or the momentum vector, and, and R is the position vector. And we can borrow this quantum mechanically to just write out the L vector as cross product between Px, Py, and Pz operators. Cross, right? This is a cross product here, not just regular times, but a vector cross product, and then cross x, y, and z operators. Okay, and now L squared, which is the operator that we've been deriving so far, is just simply Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared. Okay, so you can think about this in analogy to the NABLA operator, right? So NABLA by itself we normally think of as a vector, and quantum mechanically now, this would be the equivalent of you know, d dx, d dy, and d dz as a vector. But then when we write nabla squared, we sort of forget all about the vector components, or we, or we, we treat it as a dot product with itself, which ends up turning into a scalar, so this whole thing becomes d squared dx squared, plus d squared dy squared plus d squared dz squared. Now let's conclude by talking about what the three different components of angular momentum mean individually. This will be easier to see if we look at a, a non-symmetric molecule. So this, what I have here is the molecule benzophenone. We're showing that there are three different rotation axes that you can have around the, the center of mass. And these are Lx, Ly, and Lz. And these different components of the angular momentum correspond to rotation about these three different axes. So take a look at what I mean by this. On the left here, we have Lx. And Lx is going to rotate around the x-axis. right? And so this means that there is a, a separate angular momentum component that corresponds to this rotation around the x-axis for the molecule. And there's a similar one in the y direction and also in the, around the z-axis. Okay, so these are the three components of the angular momentum specify these three different axes around which the molecule could rotate. Uh, in this case, where there is no symmetry to make all of them equivalent. Okay, and now taking the definitions of the angular momentum from this cross product, we can write the actual operators in two different ways. So one in Cartesian coordinates, which is shown here in the dark blue, uh, these are really simple just by plugging in the, the Cartesian forms for Py and Pz. Then you get Lx, Ly, and Lz, all as these sort of mixed derivatives, right? Z ddy minus y ddz, for example, for Lx. Now on the other hand, if you write these in spherical coordinates, which is what's shown here in the dark purple, uh, then this the, the things get a little bit more complicated, right? So now you have cotangents appearing, which uh, doesn't really seem obvious at first glance, especially when you compare these to the L squared, which had nothing like this. 
Um, and but now, now these depend only on theta and phi. And the only one of these which is simple, has a simple form is LZ, which is just this rotation around the z-axis. And we'll talk more about why that is later in the class, but the simple reason for it is that you can choose one of these to be simple. And we ended up, by, by virtue of spherical coordinate system, we chose this type of angular momentum to have a simple form, whereas the other two are sort of mixed and complicated. Okay, and now in the next video, we'll start to talk about how to take these differential expressions and find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues.